What up, everybody? Welcome to Creeps of the Crypt, a podcast dedicated to reviewing each episode of Tales from the Crypt, or a review show. I'm not sure if I want to call this a podcast, because I'm not going to be putting it up on iTunes or Spotify or anything like that. So, uh, basically, what how this came about was I was reviewing Freddy's Nightmares, and I think about the first two episodes, or first four episodes I was watching, I kept saying... God, Tales from the Crypt is so much better. And I was talking to other Alan here on the, on the phone, and I'm like, he he kept saying, oh, so, like, is Tales from the Crypt really that much better or something like that? And I was like, yeah, they have great episodes, blah, blah, blah. And I told him you should watch this, this. So he started watching them, and we were talking about them. And I figured, hey, why not just do an entire podcast watching something I like and reviewing it? Instead of constantly re- reviewing, <laughs> constantly suffering through things I dislike. We were talking about, um, because you were watching Freddy's Nightmare, you're doing uh-huh. videos on it, and uh, Tales from the Crypt came up. Yeah. I've been watching a lot of it. I'm on season four right now. All right, you're supposed to be watching season, well, you haven't watched season one before, right? Only uh, only the uh, Christmas episode, and well, the, well, the first, the the first, first three, three we're going to cover. Yeah, because... Yeah, uh, most of the main ones. You didn't watch the first season, you jumped, because I told you, watch this episode, you just jumped to that, and then you went backwards, and I said season three was the best episode, the best season, in my opinion. I still think it's the best season, and you watched, you went and you watched I mean, all of that, and you, you loved it. So, we decided, let's just do this. So, we're doing this podcast because of that, but on a side note, behind the scenes, this is like the second time we're filming this podcast. There is a version, maybe one day, of the first episode we did. But Alan's mic was so bad. <laughs> and then when he listened to it and I listened to it after, we are like, no, we got to do this again. So we're going to try to do it like um, maybe this part will get yeah. cut out too, this episode. But we're going to try to do it so that we're not so. Uh, I mean, look, there, there was a lot of things I talked about in the last. And it kind of sounded generic or like reading, you know? So I don't want it to sound like that either. So I wanted to be like genuine talking about the episodes. Which I find actually entertaining or interesting. But before we go into all of that, there's something that we didn't talk about the last episode that you knew about, that you looked into. You remember we talked about it off, off of this. Is that the rights problem? You said that you said something like, "Oh yeah, I was looking into it. And I see they have a problem with the with the rights behind the the show because you can't find uh, this yeah, anywhere." I don't know if it's I don't know if it's still current, but uh, I remember looking up something. Uh, about they were trying to get M. Night Shyamalan to do uh, they were trying to bring a Tales from the Crypt back on TNT and they wanted a, a M. Night Shyamalan to uh, be a part of the show more I guess more of a what do you call it a showrunner or something mm-hmm. there was those discussions of that and nothing ever came through but I, I think there's some rights issues with the, the Crypt Keeper character because I don't think the Crypt Keeper like as we know him on the HBO show was on is in the comics he is, right. but he doesn't created it for the show. No, he, there's a crypt keeper, but he doesn't look anything like the crypt. I guess, on the show. yeah. I mean, yeah, more so, more or less, just looking like the one we know from the HBO show. Yeah, that's, that's as far as I know. That's how, as much as I looked into it. But that, that can't be the issue. Oh, I guess that could be the reason because he's in every episode, so they can't show the because, like, on Amazon, like I had this on DVD seasons one through four, I believe. I didn't get the last three seasons. <clears throat> and um, and I you know, bought them again on Amazon. And right now on Amazon, I can watch the seasons I bought, which I only bought seasons one, two, and three. I cannot watch season four, five, six, seven. It won't even show up. Technically, when I search, when uh, I look through my purchases on Amazon, on my TV shows, Tales from the Crypt doesn't show up. It doesn't even show up as a purchase that I made, which I know I, I did make it because I have it paused right now on episode four so like i own it i know i have the first three seasons those are the only ones i could watch but i can't even it's not even showing up on my list and i have to when i search it that's the only way it shows and it doesn't show up on amazon fire stick if you type in tales from the crypt on amazon fire stick it doesn't show up at all you have to go onto the prime app and in amazon which doesn't make any sense but on amazon fire stick you have to open the prime app and then i have to search in the prime app Tales from the Crypt, and then it'll show the three, all the seasons that they have, because they have them all up, but you just can't watch them. Same thing, I think, is with Tales from the Dark Side. They have, like, four seasons also, but at one point, you could watch it only in England. I don't know what happened now, but you can't watch it anywhere. 
which that's another show we should do one day. Not as good as Tales from the Crypt. Tales from the Crypt is like the creme de la creme, but, you know. Yeah, I don't know about the rights issue, but there is an issue. And so, it kind of it kind of sucks. So, the best way you could get this, I guess, is if you find it online or if you buy the DVDs on Amazon or eBay or something. Seems to be the best way. I don't. I haven't been able to find anywhere you can stream it up without paying for it in some way. Yeah, I looked at Tubi, too. I looked everywhere, and there was nothing. There's a Tales from the Crypt Season 1 trailer and uh, from M. Night Shyamalan. I think I do remember him sitting behind like a director's chair and him saying he was going to bring uh, Tales from the Crypt back, but I don't know if this is the actual trailer for it, but I've never seen this before. Is this real? I don't know. It looks real. I guess it's more like a teaser. Series trailer MP. So. Hey man, what's the problem? <laughs> it looks like Cheech. It does, huh? Wait for him to light one up. He's behind you. Oh! Oh, I missed that one. I wonder if this is real. What's the uh, description say? Is there anything in the description? Coming to TNT. Tales from the Crypt 2017 remake. Season 1 trailer. New TV. Subscribe. From Power Master M. Night Shyamalan. Tales from the Crypt was always kind of a forbidden fruit of my childhood. It was edgy. I think it was ahead of its time. So this dark, ironic tone is probably the thing that draws me to this source material. And it really, it's where I am as a storyteller. Do you really consider M. Night Shyamalan a horror master? No. It's more of like, what if we did an even? Yeah, this I did see this. A twist master. I did see this. I never seen all the best genre of TV. You can do drama, humor, a reality show for half an hour, a ten-minute short. You're gonna sit with us the whole evening. A destination for the the highest level of storytelling. The Crypt Keeper is definitely gonna be part of the evening. Someone that draws oh, yeah. us in, like the dark Walt Disney. His daughter is making her directorial debut, so... This is like candy for me. I would think it's his daughter, I don't know. The name sounds like... Uh, in the business. So they made the trailer... So they made the trailer for the new show before they even had rights to it. That's 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 smart. It seems like seems something they would do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I mean, there's not been there's been no discussion about this since then. So no, yeah. Who knows where? Who knows if we'll get one? No, I don't. Would think... I want one? I don't. I don't know if I would want one because I don't. I don't just don't think it would be as good. No. Just the way that the trend is with uh, anything they bring back in general is just kind of shit. Yeah. Before we get into uh, the first episode, the history behind why the show was even created is uh, the it was based on a comic, right? So I find it kind of funny because a lot of these guys that we admire, like Spielberg and Lucas, they were inspired by like serials on like they call them serials, I guess, or Saturday morning matinees. Like you go to the movie theater and they pay like five cents or some shit, and they'd watch a bunch of like serials little shorts right so they like uh which one was it was inspired by i think it was indiana jones is loosely inspired by flash gordon i don't know how that's possible but or maybe it was 
maybe that was what Star Wars. Maybe Star Wars is loosely inspired by Flash Gordon. I don't know. I know they were fans of like the old serials and, and they talked about that, right? And they, well, Robert Zemeckis is a producer on this with Richard Donner, these great directors, and they were all fans of EC Comics, entertaining comics. I think they were called, enter they were educational comics at one point. And then it became EC Comics and they were published by uh, William M. Gaines who inherited the comic book uh, company from his father who died. Uh, he never wanted to do anything with comic books. He wanted to be a teacher. But his father died and his mother pressured him to take over the company. And for the longest time, they were just following along what everyone else was doing. You know, so like now, when you see clickbait articles online for every fucking thing, and everyone's posting them because they just follow the trend. So they were doing that back in the day, and he wasn't making any money. And so he hired this guy named Al Feldstein, and they both realized that they loved those old radio shows. See, it always goes back to what you grew up, right? So when they were kids, there was no fucking TV. <laughs> there was, so they had to listen to the radio and they got all their entertainment from the radio and there were old radio shows that were scary. So they said, you know what? Let's start writing some of these things that we like. So they started writing horror stories and then they had three different comics who became success successful and they had The Crypt of Terror that would become Tales from the Crypt the Haunt of Fear, and Crime Suspense Stories. They became success so successful that, I don't know, in the 50s, parents went crazy, started burning books and shit, and started blaming uh, comic books as the cause of their children being delinquents, juvenile delinquency. So much so that the Senate had hearings, the Senate had a subcommittee hearing on juvenile delinquency, and uh, but it wasn't for EC Comics, but, but William Games went, <laughs> he went there to get the the credit he deserved or he wanted and he said i created this people were following me like he had to let everybody know they're following me now um there's a great documentary on the tales from the crypt dvd the first season or you can find it on uh, youtube uh explains their relationship everything that happened how he created um you know ec comics how he created mad comics if it wasn't for him we wouldn't have a lot of the things we have today so much so we wouldn't have tales from the crypt to show that these directors that like are huge hitters in Hollywood at the time all decided to produce this show. And we're talking like, I'm surprised Spielberg wasn't involved in this, but it was Robert Zemeckis, Walter Hill, um, the one that directed episode three. Uh, oh my God, I forgot his name. Richard Donner. Richard Donner. Yeah, so like a lot of heavy hitters. So they did this and we think, and also like George Romero and... Um, Stephen King were fans of this guy's of EC Comics too because Creepshow is based on also based on EC Comics, and in the documentary, Arl Stein's also there and, and look at all the goosebumps and fear books and Fear Street books. He said he was a fan of that too. So this guy created a lot of you know uh, talented people with, with whatever work they created inspired many talented people. So with that being said, let's get into the first episode of Tales from the Crypt season one, and because the first. Uh, when it first aired, it aired three episodes in one night. We're going to do the first three episodes today. So the first episode is called The Man That Was Death. I did not really like this episode. I think it was directed by Walter Hill. You, What do you think about this? Because I've been talking forever. Um, yeah, I, it wasn't my favorite episode. It's... Um... Uh, it's something we talked about before um, in the, the shitty recording we did uh, from my end. Is uh, It sets the stage for the rest of the series of what to expect. The episode's about uh, this um, this guy who uh, works at the at this prison who's a executioner, I guess. Uh, he mentioned that he'd worked for them as like a electrician, but he ended up getting promoted into, I guess, executioner. He's just pretty much the guy that flips the switch on these uh, death row inmates. And um, in the episode, you find out that the the state that they're in, I forgot what state it is, but they were going to outlaw the death penalty. So he was pretty much out of the job. And um, he ended up getting let go because of the morale surrounding him and what he was doing in the prison. You know, all, all of his, uh, his work prior to the legislator changing the rule on the death penalty. So as that happens, that is him. He starts killing people in the episode and just kind of uh in his own sense of justice so pretty much becoming his judge jury and executioner throughout the episode yeah so he goes around 
everybody gets let off, he gets pissed and he goes and kills them. And uh, I believe, because I, I haven't watched the first episode, I find it kind of boring. And no offense to Will, uh, Will Sadler or... Walter Hill. I Walter think. Hill, yeah. No offense to Walter Hill or Bill Sadler, but it's just not my cup. It's just boring. I don't find anything... I'm surprised that they picked this episode to be the pilot to kick it off. If it was... Look, I like I said it, I said it when we did the last review, or last podcast that we can't use, but nobody's heard. I remember, all and all through the house being the first episode I saw, I think this was what, the second. It was like this, that, and then I, I really don't remember if uh, the Joey Pants episode aired that time, but they say online that it did, so let's just say that, <laughs> that it did. But I don't, this one was so, yeah. But uh, yeah, he goes and he kills the people that got away, and there's no twist because he's a bad person. It's also told in a very different way than any episode will be told throughout the entire series. Because, like, it's so weird. We get introduced to the story by the Crypt Keeper, who's not the same Crypt Keeper as he's going to later be. He talks very slow and methodical because he's, like, cr- the crepit, right? That's what the voice actor thought. And then mm-hmm. he's telling us this is the story called The Man. It was death. And then it starts, and then all of a sudden, Will Sadler's narrating the fucking episode. You know? And yeah. I, I'm sure there's probably episodes like that where we hear voiceovers in it as well, but it just felt weird, like, jumping right into it, and then uh, you hear the guy crying, like, he's, he's, he's he knows he's, this is his last meal, and then you just hear Will Sadler talk. Well, that there, right there, that boy is Reginald Lang Gleason or Charlie Ledbetter. There, right there is Charlie Ledbetter. And Charlie, well, he did, well, he did this and that, and some boy got shot in the way out. It wasn't really his fault, but well, poor Charlie, he just happened to reside in the wrong state. <laughs> some shit, you know. He plays yeah, Niles. Uh, soliloquies. Yeah, he play. Uh, William Sadler plays Niles Talbot, and that's uh, he, that's he's just. Loves killing people. And at the end, he's a bad guy. So he takes, starts taking justice into his own hands. At the end, he's about to kill this woman. And it doesn't work. He gets caught. And then it, somehow, <laughs> they brought back the death penalty. But I think he... I don't remember. See, it would have been funny if he goes, Well, what are you going to do? Put me in for life? Or something like that. <laughs> like, they didn't add anything like that. I don't remember them adding anything where he would be, like, cocky about it. And say, well, you, now you're going to lock me up with them animals that I, that, you know, you got to do, I don't know. No, they just said, no, yeah, we reinstated just for you or they just, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, they decided that they reinstated the death penalty and uh, they're going to kill him. So it was kind of like a <laughs> lackluster episode, in my opinion. It was just very straightforward. There was not anything that we come to expect from late, later episodes in the show that, Sometimes there's some episodes like that where they're very straightforward. There's not a, really anything that I would say it makes it a good episode. Usually the ones that I like are the ones that have a good idea and concept of the plot. And then sometimes even they'll, they'll have a good ending to them or sometimes they won't. But at least the idea of it was good. But this one is just re- really, straight, really straightforward. So mm-hmm. not anything... Not anything... Um, yeah, like that there would be a twist or there's no horror elements and there's no uh, much of anything of, of that nature. It's very straightforward. Any, it, this would be something you'd see on maybe a, any other uh, network, uh, you know, regular episode maybe of, uh, I don't know, Law and Order, uh, if you include some of the other court stuff in there. But, I, uh, yeah, I think pretty the, straightforward. What, what the only benefit it had at all really would be setting the tone of what the series is going to look like. In that we're gonna yeah. get sex and immoral characters, like, cause like before we're following a character who, like, see for us this is like, but back then you're watching a show and you're already following a like a bad person. We're not so like before the Sopranos, people it's like we never fa- followed a guy who was like a like a main character who's a bad person, right? It was always a good person that might be you know a complex character. He may do immoral things, but he's a good person at heart, right? And then, like, all oh, the Sopranos changed all that. And then we have Walter White and things like that. This kind of is, like, the first interpretation of that. Where we're getting a show and all of a sudden, boom. Oh, it's an ex- he's an ex- we're following an executioner. And he likes killing people. He does not it's, not. it's not he hates his job. No, he loves his job. And he's pissed the fuck off that he just got canned. 
So now he's going to take his revenge, and he's going to go. If people get off when he knows they should be, uh, they they should have met his him his hand uh, or, or met they should have met the chair under his hand, or whatever the fuck, however you say it. <laughs> That he's going to go kill you. He's going to find you. He's going to do it. So in that sense, I guess back in the 90s, that is a, a way to set the tone. Like we're going to follow immoral people. So that see, now we're looking at it through 2023. We got to look back on it in 1989 and look and go, oh, yeah, it wasn't really like that. Even Freddy's Nightmares, you're not following bad people. The kids are good kids mostly. Yeah, in a way that that episode sets the stage for the rest of the series, pretty much. But yeah, not one of my favorite ones. But it, um, I could see why they started out with that first episode. But I, yeah, personally, I think you and I would agree that the the, the next one after one that would have been a good. Oh, that's the one to the, start the show so. with. Yes, that's the one you yeah. start with. Robert Zemeckis. Okay, uh, well, who's the, who wrote it? The guy who wrote uh, Monster Squad and directed uh, he directed Monster Squad. And he directed Night of the Creeps, which I found that out when we were doing the first, <laughs> which I found out while watching this. Uh, what's his name? Frederick? Wait, let me see. I wrote it down. Fred Decker. See, I, I've never seen Monster Squad, so I'm going to have to see that one day. But Fred Decker wrote this episode and all through the house. It's a Christmas episode. So I was Larry Drake, uh, also known as the bad guy from, uh, what's, he's the bad guy in Dark, Dark Man, Man and, yeah. and uh, Dr. Dr. Giggles, Giggles right? yes, and Dr. Giggles. <laughs> uh, he's a great actor. I'll have to watch that. He's, I haven't seen it in years. It's probably campy as shit. I remember it came out before Scream. And all through the house, the woman, I forgot her name, the actress, she's very sexy. She's in everything in the 90s. She's in a lot of things in small roles. Like, I remember I went crazy when I found, I remembered, oh, she was uh, in um, Forrest Gump. I just I remember her bringing in little Forrest when Forrest sees Jenny for the first time after you know all that, that she left him, and she brings little Forrest and she goes, "Hi, this is, no no." She goes, uh, "She goes, oh Jenny, this is my friend Forrest from back home." And then she goes, "Oh hi, nice to meet you." And she goes, oh, "I have to do this to this place. I'm not gonna." Oh okay, but he goes, "You you're a mama, Jenny." <laughs> Anyway, Zemeckis also hired her on Back to the Future too, and she's been in a lot of Zemeckis thing. And Donner, uh, Donner had her in. Uh, was Donner did Donner direct Lethal Weapon? Right, he did direct Lethal Weapon. Yeah, he did. I, I'm not. Sh I think the first three or the first two. I can't remember. What yes, because he wants Mel Gibson to direct. He before he, I think he passed away. I could be mistaken. Yeah, Donna there's did. There's a lot of cross. There's a lot of cross sections between people that are part of the show that are producers. You know, Donna, uh, Joel Silver, everybody else that's a part of the show. There's a lot of uh, people that they. I mean, also actors from the '90s that you would know, that were all a part of this the show in some way, shape, or form, or they had some associations with the producers too. So, there's a lot of the those those themes in that one. So yeah, she was in quite a few different things too yeah but anyway she's in this and she, and everything else she's ever done she doesn't look sexy and this she looks beyond sexy i don't know what it is maybe she's barely wearing clothes <laughs> but no she looks great even her eyes she looks very beautiful in this episode even for an older woman but this episode is basically about christmas time it just takes you this is the perfect episode for any Definitely for Tales from the Crypt, because first off, you are thrown into Christmas time, right? Different different holiday, right? So it's joyful, everything's nice and happy, and you hear the Nat King Cole chestnuts roasting on an open fire, and you see the snow falling, and it's beautiful. You see a man sitting there drinking by a fire, and he goes to his wife who's behind him, who's beautiful, and wearing you know her lovely nightgown, and he goes, this fire needs to be fixed. Give me the fire poker. And she goes, what? He goes, give me the fire poker. What are you, hard of hearing? And then she just goes, okay. And she just whacks him over the top of his head with it, killing him. Who he was also in Freddy's uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. He was Coach Snyder. Um, always plays a dick. Always plays a dick in everything. And, 
and then we go over to, to right there that's the tone that's what you want to tell people like wait a second you think you're gonna be a happy show and then boom this shit happens out of nowhere right off the bat instantly and then uh she's gonna she goes to get rid of the body and her little daughter wakes up says she hurt santa claus that's another thing that's going to continue throughout the show and she goes no you didn't hear anything let's go back to bed or, and uh, she says, good night, Jacob. Oh, no, Joseph. Good night, Joseph. And he goes, Joseph doesn't say anything because he's dead. Huh, Mom, how come Joseph didn't say anything to me? Uh, how come Joseph didn't say good night to me? And she goes, oh, he's dead tired or whatever. And then she puts him to bed. It's time to get rid of Joseph. And at this time, see, I'm going off memory. I haven't seen the episode in a while. Um, what exactly? He, she takes him out, right? She's going to throw him in. Oh, she first she calls her boyfriend, right? Says, I did it. Yeah, she calls her boyfriend and uh, she's holding like a piece of paper. It looked like some sort of um, uh, some sort of will. Or insurance. And, uh, yeah, pretty much uh, is in, was in collusion with whoever she's uh, uh, talking to over the phone. We never see him in the episode, but it's alluded that, yeah, she was having an affair and she was wanting to kill the husband for... Um, yeah, for the you know life money insurance and, or the and will and yeah. stuff. Yeah, life insurance. And then so she goes to throw him out with some voicemail because she doesn't talk to him. Because if she talked to him, it'd be weird. Why she wouldn't call him back later? But that they set it up, nice way to set it up. Like, oh no, he's not there. So she's not gonna call him because he's just gonna go to his voicemail, so or his answering machine back there. So she goes to throw him over into the well. She say like he went to check the well for some fucking reason. He fell and cracked his head open. So uh, sometime during this time, we hear on the radio that a guy escaped from a mental institute and he's killing people. And then she encounters him outside. Out of nowhere, this psycho in a Santa suit is trying to attack her and she's bugging the fuck out and flipping out. The door closed on her the first time and she left her purse inside. So she's locked yeah. out and then he's there behind her because she hurts and then he has the axe. He grabbed the axe that was on the wood and then she falls on top of the the cut wood and he's crazy this fucker he's so good at playing a psychopath and he's just bugging out and it's just well directed because you have Robert Zemeckis directing it and he pushes her like into like about to fall into the well herself now Now she, then she grabs the ice pick or the icicle and she pulls it she cuts him in the face and he starts screaming and then she cuts him in the balls and she starts running into the house oh the door closed but it was open that time later it's when it, it's it's not closed. Um, it's locked. It locks by itself, which I don't know how the first time it didn't lock, but the second time it does lock. And she has the axe with her, so she cuts his she cuts his hand, and then he starts screaming, and then he's out. So she locks the door. She calls the police, and then she calls the police. She realizes, oh shit! Like she calls for help, but then she realizes, oh shit! I have Joseph. Over. Like Joseph's there, you know. And then she's like, what the fuck am I gonna do? And he's gone. He's trying to find another way into the house. But it's like, she's like, I can't tell that I have to hang up. Like, how am I going to explain this? So then she looks outside. He's gone. She hangs up. She goes to the back window in Joseph's office. I keep calling him Jacob. In Joseph's office, she goes to the back window. And then she looks at the phone. Fucking Larry Drake throws the fucking uh, swing tire through the window. Right? And then grabs her and starts choking her. He's all fucked up already. And she reaches for the fucking axe, and that's when she she hits him in the in the head with the axe, but the back part, not the sharp part. So then he falls back. Uh, he's knocked out. So then she's like, "Oh, she this is a screen for that window, which isn't. I mean, he can just jump through that because it's it's like a, it's a garbage uh, screen. It's just wooden like <laughs> garbage. So then the phone rings. She's like, "What the fuck?" So she answers, and it's the police, and they tell her. This guy's escaped because she didn't hear it before. And then she, uh, I think then or there later she calls again. I think there she says, yes, he's here. He's killed my husband. He killed my husband. And then she's like, oh, I got a good idea. I'm going to take this fucking axe and I'm going to make it look like he killed Joseph. And then I get away with it. But then he, she realizes when she looks back out, oh, he's gone now. Now I have to deal with him again. It was just a good episode in general. There's a lot of stuff still missing from this. As I'm going off what I remember, I know that there's a, there's a part where she gets locked in the closet. 
and she can't get out. She was looking for his gun so she could attack him. She goes out to fucking take the axe and hit Jacob over the head so it does look like, and she gets locked out. All this shit happens, all leading up to the very end where uh, <laughs> the daughter let fucking <laughs> Psycho into the house and she went upstairs because she was scared the daughter was going to get killed. She breaks out of the closet, goes upstairs. The daughter's gone from the room. She goes down the stairs and she goes, look, mommy, you see, I told you he'd come. And he just comes back right out of the other room. And he does the famous line. Naughty or nice. That's, that's what the title of the show, should, the episode should have been. That would have been, that would have tied it all up really nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's laughs> It goes, and then yeah, she does the she's the more dramatic scream of screaming and no of even worse than the Darth Vader in the episode. Yeah, three. well, this was good though. It's good screaming. I think it's probably the red outfit that she looks so hot in. She really does look sad. like really. If you look at anything else she's ever been, I never. She looks like your average housewife. <laughs> but yeah, yeah she I have looks to look good. at some still images of uh, her and other stuff. But yeah, she she was pretty hot in that episode, and yeah, it was good. It was overall a good episode. It was just good tension, good music, uh, good choice of uh, just overall great. I mean, directed well, had some good shots in there. And yeah, that that's what makes a, a pretty decent um, Tales from the Crypt episode. Oh, she's that's in the Monster I, Squad too. I didn't know that. There you go. I mean, they're all tied to each other in some way. I remember her from Greedy. She was one of them. Yes, yeah, I saw that movie. I'm probably the only one of the only people that liked that movie with Michael J. Fox and Phil Hartman. Uh, that was a good movie, Greedy. But anyway, yes, this is the best episode I think, or one of the best episodes of this season. Um. I know I talked a lot through it because I love this episode. The next episode, I'm going to let Alan talk because he saw it for the first time today. So if I was to rate the episodes out of like five stars, let's say episode one for me would get two stars. What about for you? Uh, that's yeah, that's pretty harsh. But out of yeah, out of, uh, out of five, I would say I give it a solid. Uh, I give it a solid three. Yeah. Three out of five. It was competent. Yeah, uh, episode two for me and all through the house, I'd give it five out of five stars. Superb, the best. The be oh, I didn't even mention the uh, the music is so it goes so well too. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. Doom, 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 doom. I'm just like oh shit, oh like I'm nervous too. I it, it's so it's masterful, masterful. This is a, this is what an excellent director. I wish Robert Zemeckis directed regular movies more often again because <laughs> you know everything with him is a new form of CG or. Using yeah, you know, thing, new, you know, things like, like computer generated. Yeah, Polar Express, and I'm gonna do Beowulf, and which I like Beowulf, even though it's the old CG. <laughs> it's really not good. Like, it could use an update again. But uh, I'm gonna give it. Yeah, I'm gonna give it about the same. Yeah, I'd say that's just pretty. It's it's hard to think of anything that I that would uh, would ding the uh, episode for because overall it was pretty. Pretty, pretty flawless and masterful from beginning to end. So I can't, I can't really give it anything lower than a five out of five. So yeah, I'm gonna go with the same five out of five on that one. <laughs> I, I want to know what you thought about this, but I'm just going first. I go into episode three, starring Joey Pants from The Sopranos and The Matrix and Baby's Day Out. The greatest, greatest movie ever made was Baby's Day Out. So <laughs> Joey Pantaloni uh, is is Ulrich. The Undying, but for, he's not Ulrich at the beginning, but the, he's in this episode. He's a star. And the episode's called Dig That Cat. He's Real Gone. I don't understand the title of that at all, so I don't know what that's about. But basically, he's this drunk. This doctor approaches him, and he's like, listen, you want to make some money? I, this money could be yours. He's a homeless drunk. If you let me do a little experiment on you. And he's like, what? So he's like, okay, I'll do the experiment. He decides to do it. The experiment involves taking a pituitary gland or something from a cat and putting it into his brain that will give him nine lives. And then he becomes Ulrich the Undying, goes to carnivals and kills himself in front of an audience of people uh, in order for profit for money. That's just the episode. It starts out, this. I, I guess this is, this is an episode where it starts out where at the end and then he t tells us the origin story. So he's in the, what's supposed to be like his his last of his line, nine lives, and he's in this coffin, he's gonna be buried alive, and he tell and while he's buried alive, he tells us the whole story. This also should have been or could have been the pilot episode. 
And uh, he's in the coffin laying down and he tells us exactly how this all started and everything. Uh, leads up to an epic twist at the end. Yeah, so after all the stuff that happens with uh, all the all Death. the acts he puts yeah. apart, he puts on throughout the episode. Um, yeah, he finds out he's on his last life because he, um, yeah, he, he, I think he just lost count. No, that uh, was the the cat was the cat lost his life in order to give him eight lives. Oh yeah. So that's so one that, life. That was yeah. that was kind of that was part of part of it. Yeah, that's yeah. where I mixed he, it up there. He goes. He's lady. He goes. At the end, he goes. Oh, all thanks to that poor cat that lost his life. And then he goes. Oh shit. <laughs> that I guess cat. I would have made the same mistake too. I would have thought that I was on, on my coming up on my uh, not your last my eighth, life. My eighth life. Yeah. yeah. Not only like, yeah, he did. thought it was his yeah his. He was know, on his eighth one, but he was on actually his on ninth. His, yeah. Ninth one. Yeah. yeah, that was the that's kind of like the twist and realization. He had eight, and that was his fucking last life. That's it. Boop. And he's buried alive. He starts screaming at the end, and then there's two guys, these grave diggers, like you don't think they actually put somebody in there, right? Ah, it's bullshit. And then you hear like howling like a cat, which is funny because there are parts. This whole fucking episode's shot really funny. Like <laughs> Robert Wald's in it. He plays the. The Carnival Barkeep, right? Or the Barker. Carnival Barker? I don't know what the fuck. Barker, yeah. Yeah, he's like, he's such a fucking... I hate Robert Wall, and I think it was because of him in this, and also as Knox in Batman. I thought he was the worst part of, of Batman I was, I was gonna, I was going to say, because that's, that's what I know him from the most, is like, yeah, he really was the kind of the worst, the worst <laughs> character in the... In the '89 Batman, yeah, he was the worst. It's got different mustaches throughout the episode, and yeah, what Fu I liked Manchu. about it was like the way it was shot, because some of the, the big, even in the beginning, and uh, which, which, uh, yeah, the, you, there's a cameo of Richard Donner in, in the audience in the beginning. Mm. You, you would have to know what he looks like. Cause I didn't know um, off my head what he looks like, but he's in, he's in, in the episode in the beginning, one of the one of the crowd chanting Ulrich, and then. Yeah, the way it's shot, it's really good because it's like it's kind of very. It almost f- makes you feel like you're there. Like it's shot in almost like a over the shoulder kind of mm. kind of style. Almost even prior to like anything, like Blair Witch style. You yeah, know, in, that, in that sense, but you know, better quality. It didn't look like shit. Like it was actually shot. But on it was only during quarter. only during the times of his death. Like you felt like you're in the crowd. Like you're you're there. Yeah, when he, yeah. whenever he was kind of performing the acts or yeah. just kind of when they're setting a mood. But yeah, they're generally so most of the time is is shot pretty still most of the time. And the one that I yeah, remember, the one I remember the most is the arrow through the heart because they, they repeated like they repeated the scene twice like they had a shot of robert wall laughing with the girl <laughs> and they redid the shot again with them laughing and it's a different different take but it's supposed to be the yeah. same. like they, i'm like there, it happened like twice in that yeah. so like i don't I don't know what that was about like it, if i thought that was like me or something or something skipped like it there's like quick scenes like last like maybe a second or two that repeat repeat again. yeah it's, yeah i don't know what that was about. i like it <laughs> And yeah. that was when uh, who shot? I think it was some guy. I don't know if that was Richard Donner at that point. Maybe that was no, not because of the redneck and his son. The son is is uh, Donkey Lips from uh, Salute Your Shorts and from the Willies, the episode where the the kid and the flies. So uh, he's in this episode. He plays the one that shoots him in the. He shoots something, and I don't know why uh, Robert Wool's like fucking asshole. I don't know why. They shoot um. Uh... A crossbow, a bolt. Yeah, crossbow. but he shoots it at something that, and then makes Robert Wall go fucking kid. I'm like, why? I don't understand. I don't know. It was like a a, a skull, and I don't know. I don't know whatever. I think, um, yeah, I can't remember, but I know what you're talking about. I think yeah. he maybe, I think he got him in the shoulder or something. Maybe or the balls or something. Or something. Oh, oh yeah, he got him in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he actually did. He said it's like, oh, I didn't mean him. Hit him in the balls. Like he, ah. he, he shot an arrow through <laughs> at his balls. So. <laughs> there we go. Goes, uh, Joey pans his balls, but yeah, like with this um, good episode, really good episode. That would have been a better episode to start with because it actually does also set up the idea of yeah, what to expect. What to expect? In the series. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he starts out the episode like uh, yeah, from like a it was a flash forward or a flashback. He talks about his, he was already in the coffin and everything, and he gets recruited by the scientist because he was like a bum and stuff before yeah. he was living out of a living out of a box, box. literally <laughs> out of an amazon box <laughs> prior to amazon mm-hmm. uh and then yeah 
but yeah, we also missed the part where he gets betrayed by the chick he was yeah. dating. There's uh, his like assistant. He gets yeah. betrayed by her, and she takes his money. But I thought she and, doesn't. She doesn't say it in the episode, but I just felt like after the cop got the money, that they just went together. That she just stole the money from him and went with the cop. Because, possibly, but I don't know. It did, it did. It wasn't very clear. Like it's just yeah. it, that was the only twist that from the tales from the crypt that actually it got me by surprise. I just didn't see it coming. Yeah, that she, that she would do that. Portray, yeah, that she was going to portray him. She was such but a good man. It was, it was good. I mean, uh, Joey Pants needs to, yeah, needs to 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 have been more stu- more stuff. Like he's one of those uh, very underrated actors. I guess you you consider him more of a character actor. I consider him one of the greats, one of the great actors that doesn't get recognition. There's a lot of, I, I guess, would, character yeah, actors. Yeah, I would say so. There's, there's a guy, Rob, Robert, the, who's the guy in Vacancy, the guy behind the counter? He's another actor that's, Frank Wally, I think is his name. Whenever he's in anything, too, it's like he's such a great, talented actor. I guess when I say character actor, I mean that I get, uh, my understanding of the definition is like playing in an in a, in eccentric character or, or usual unusual people rather than like leading roles you know so he's usually no yeah a, no yeah I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's not to be eccentric just just playing different people yeah. a lot and sometimes they are eccentric because uh the, the guy who plays uh back to the future he's the one with the glasses that guy is a phenomenal character actor he does anytime he's in anything he does he's magnificent i don't know his fucking name but he was the one with the glasses in back to the future He's the one who, in the future, 1985, in the alternate universe, he's like the cowboy for some reason out of the Friends. <laughs> like he's a cowboy. He's always has a fucking cat. But when it, and he does play eccentric characters sometimes. Or but he's just these are just when I see these actors, I know it's a that that at least that 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 character is gonna have a good like gonna be played well. Like I don't have to worry. You know what I mean? Like. I got oh see oh Frank Wally's in this or oh this guy's mm-hmm. in this like this is gonna be his acting's gonna be good. Joey Pants is a little bit different <laughs> in that he's in just like a lot of good things and I, he's sometimes in stupid shit like just playing you know like bad boys. Baby's Day Out. Baby, <laughs> Baby's Day Out is amazing. <laughs> Sopranos is basically what I really know him from besides Baby's Day Out and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the it's like the point you made. Yeah, like I yeah, I knew that this was going to be a good episode because he was in it. So it's good to see him have a leading role mm-hmm. at least in this um yeah in this uh, spectrum. So overall, yeah, it's great episode. I like I mean, it's just everything about it was. I think I like it more than the the Christmas one. I gotta really? say, I, I mean they're both good, but I think that one I I would rewatch that again for sure. I'd say yeah, that's a solid five out of five for me on the Joey Pants episode. Yeah, I didn't see, see the, the I didn't see the next one we'll talk about later on. But that one is that the one that has <laughs> Leah Thompson in it, right? Yes, it does. You're not a fan of hers, right? I'm not a fan of her. I think like okay. acting wise. I think you watch it when you watch it. You're gonna text me right away, and you're gonna say, "Oh no!" <laughs> you're gonna go, oh no! I see what you're talking about. It's like William Hurt when he was in the first Incredible Hulk movie with Edward Norton. Oh, wow. He thought he was in the comic book movie. Like, you know, overacting. That's yeah, what she yeah. does in this. Just comes down to, like, just direction. I Not guess. taking it seriously. Yeah. I don't just even... having a oh, oh, yeah. better who, idea what she's in. Who, 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 who directed this episode? Uh, that next episode. He also directed her in another movie. Some kind of wonderful. Is he married to her in real life? Yes, he is. No oh, wonder. Man. He's married to her in real life nepotism at his best no wonder no wonder he probably married her uh, started dating her on some kind of wonderful i mean yeah we'll talk about it uh next time we uh record for it or Mm. watch it on youtube now maybe probably it's probably on there right now you let let me know because uh only was it only skin deep yes only sin deep oh sin deep all right yeah yeah hold on uh, let me see if it's on there only so I use my other website to watch it. This is better quality. Um, let me see. It's on YouTube. Only send send deep. Let me see how the quality is. <laughs> not, not the greatest. Oh, it is on there. Hold on. It's just on. It's just on. Um, let me see. 
There's an episode called Only Skin Deep Also. That's stupid. Of Tales of the Crypt. No, watch it on that other site. The other site's better. Yeah, I won't watch it on YouTube. I'm just curious. Right anyway. That, that could be a way we could uh, do a live react to it. I don't want to do a live react because it's still, I have to show the video. It has, <laughs> I still have to get somebody to, my guy to do two different camera shits. <clears throat> That's what I have oh, to yeah. do. Oh, yeah, right. don't worry about it then. I'll, uh, I'll watch it. I mean, we'll it. do I'll one. Probably... We'll, we'll do it later on. Not right now. I'm trying. Like... Yeah, we'll, we'll do it on a good episode. Or, yeah, or the movie. When we get to the movie. Oh, shit. Yeah. Bordello I, I watch, Blood. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not Bordello of Blood. But anyway, first off, so you give it five out of five. Oh, wait, I wanna, wait, wait. Let me cut back to, to Leah Thompson. Okay, right. I'm looking. I'm not, I was looking at her IMDb for a brief second. Once I saw that the director of that episode was the fucking husband. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, no wonder. No wonder. So anyway, uh, I can't find anything she's done good besides Back to the Future and Howard the Duck. Uh Nothing. That's. I mean, yeah. I mean, she. I mean, I objectively, she's really all unknown for, yeah, Howard the Duck and uh, Back to the Future, but more so Back to the Future. Yeah. I mean, I. I can't. She's made appearances of other stuff. Like. Can you believe? She probably, she, she probably wasn't a Law and Order episode, but that's about it. Yeah. Can you believe being the director and her husband and telling her that wait till you see the episode. That's all I'm going to say. Wait till you see the episode <laughs> and let me know that how as a husband and a director you allow your wife to do this to embarrass herself. As an actress, you'll see, you'll see. So we'll talk about this episode next week, or next uh, bi-weekly, so the week after, whatever. But yes, that that's well, they'll hear it. We'll hear. It. We'll talk next week. They'll hear it the week after, whatever this airs. Well, knowing that and knowing that ahead of time, yeah, I'll definitely keep an eye out and see see um, how it is. Now that we know that the director and her were married, or they, together, they were but... to, they were dating at this time, probably. But yeah. At... Yeah, awesome. I'm not really curious now to see how uh, how it is now, now that you mentioned it. Yeah, it's probably like just probably the latter, you know. It's, it's not a bad episode. Just, just, it's just not a bad episode. The, just just gave her the hook up and to 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 yeah to hook up with her. So I'm sure. Yeah, it's not a bad episode. Sure. I will say that it's not a bad episode. So yeah, I can't get any worse than the. I'm trying to think of the the, the worst one I watched so far from Tales from the Crypt. Let Can't get any worse than the kind of the that, the one with the witch. The witch, there was like the witch that's oh, that's bodies season three, with it. yeah. Yeah, that one yeah I don't like that shit. one either. That one was pretty shitty. Yeah, just the way everything happened. But yeah, I I'll think let you know. We'll, we'll talk about. I, it I, I, and in general, for me, I think after well, we'll talk about when the season's over when we can conclude it and top rate our top episodes of the top episodes of uh, the season. But um, anyway. I'll give this episode also a five out of five. I really like this. Joey Pants is great. The girl's annoying. Robert Wall's a little bit annoying, but Joey Pants saves it. The idea saves it. The filming also, the way it was filmed, Richard Donner did a good job. Very interesting. I felt like it's just great. Oh, yeah. So it was really good. So that's the first three episodes of Tales from the Crypt. Um, we will see you guys the next time. This is bi-weekly, so you'll hear it a, a week after next. So um, whenever you're hearing this, maybe you can hear it right away because <laughs> it could be in the future and you could just, oh, it's a playlist. But anyway, so we'll talk to you guys next time. Let us know what you thought about the first three episodes. Are we completely wrong with episode one? Was it great? Was my idea correct about we never really saw a bad guy follow a bad guy in a film or TV before and this was the first time? So that is kind of unique. But let me know what you think down below. We'll talk to you guys next time. Peace.